Hello, everyone. Welcome to the International Methods Colloquium. I am Justin Essary, an Associate Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Wake Forest University. The International Methods Colloquium is a periodic, online, interactive seminar discussion on the application of quantitative statistical methodology to the social sciences, sponsored by Wake Forest University and previously sponsored by Rice University and the National Science Foundation. This week's speakers are J. Brandon Duckmayer of Washington University in St. Louis and Shushe Ishima of Harvard University. Both of them, incidentally, are presenting co-authored work. We're currently hosting a special series of presentations originally slated for the 2020 annual meeting of the Midwest Political Science Association that was canceled due to the outbreak of COVID-19. Each session will host two talks lasting 20 to 25 minutes each, uh, followed by a Q&A. You can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that appears at the bottom of the webinar window, and you can ask questions at any time during the talk, but they will be held until the end of the presentation. A link to each presenter's slideshow will be available in the Zoom webinar chat window so that you may refer to it throughout the presentation, and I will post those links right after we get started. Our first presentation will be from uh, J.B. Duckmayer of Washington University in St. Louis, and he's presenting a talk entitled GPERT, a Gaussian Process Model for Item Response Theory, and this is co-authored work with Roman Garnett and Jacob Montgomery, also of uh, Wustel. JB, take it away. All right, uh, so first, uh, thanks for virtually attending this IMC pre presentation. Uh, my name is J. Brandon Duckmeyer. I'm presenting co-authored work with Roman Garnett and Jacob Montgomery, uh, GPIRT, a Gaussian Process Model for Item Response Theory, which is forthcoming in the proceedings of the 36th Conference on Uncertainty in Artificial Intelligence. So I'll be presenting a Gaussian process model for item response theory, and so it will be useful to do a first a brief overview of item response theory models in general. So in the IRT setting, what we have are data that looks like this. So we have a number of items, which could be um, survey questions, it could be roll call votes, and we have a number of respondents, such as survey respondents or legislators in the roll call context. And we have observed um, each of the respondents' responses to each of the items. Uh, we're usually talking about dichotomous data here. So it could be um, agree or disagree with a survey item or vote yay or nay on a roll call vote. And uh, so from this data, we're trying to learn a couple of things. So first, we want to learn about the respondents, something called their latent trait, which will denote throughout the talk as theta. So this is placing the respondents into a latent space. So in the roll call context, it could be putting legislators on the left-right ideological spectrum, for example. We also want to learn about the items, and so specifically, how the respondents latent traits are going to translate into responses to the item. So how do we usually do that? Um, so we usually start by assuming a functional form for what we call the item response function or IRF, which is the function that maps uh, latent traits to the probability of a positive response. And so uh, a, a popular choice, for example, is um, we could say that the probability of a positive response is going to be the normal CDF of a difference between this alpha term, which we call the difficulty parameter, which is the point in the latent space at which you have a one half probability of a positive response, and the beta term called a discrimination parameter uh, multiplied by the latent trait. So this is a common um, assumed functional form in the IRT literature, for example. So starting off with this functional form assumption, we can then use various inference methods to learn the item parameters of the item response functions and the respondents latent traits. So we're going to be going from something like the data that I showed you before, which is in the top left panel, um, to placing the respondents on the latent space depicted by these dots and learning the item response functions depicted in the plots of the other three panels. So I'm gonna zoom in to um, this item response function for item one in the top right panel to talk about it a little further, right? So first you'll see that 
we have uh, used this data to place the respondents um, on this latent continuum. Um, and then using uh, these latent uh, space placements and their responses to the items, uh, we have learned, right, an item potential item response function for this using this uh, particular functional form that we've assumed. But let's stop and think about um, this functional form assumption that I first presented to you, which is sort of the standard IRT model that's often used, this two-parameter model. It imposes some strict assumptions, such as monotonicity, which is that as your latent trait increases, your probability of a positive response is going to monotonically increase or decrease. Uh, symmetry, which is around, uh, going in both directions from that point where the probability of a positive response is one half, you're going to be increasing and decreasing the probability of a one response in a symmetric way. It also assumes saturation, which is as you go in one direction far enough, your probability of a positive response goes to one and in the other direction goes to zero. Now, there are a number of extensions or also unfolding models that can address each of these assumptions. So instead of, for example, uh, fitting that two parameter IRT model that I showed you before, we could have instead fit an unfolding model, which our uh, estimated IRF for the item I showed you might look like this, where it comes back down to pick up the negative response from this far right respondent. And in fact, like I mentioned, there are a number of such uh, extensions and alternate uh, functional form parameterizations. So this is the unfolding model that can address monotonicity. This is the standard model I showed you before. Here's uh, a model specification that could address saturation. You can see the probabilities don't go to one or zero. And you, know, you could have also uh, an extension to address sy symmetry, et cetera. However, when you're in this parametric IRT world, you have to know which model to use a priori, and you can't exactly mix and, mix and match across items because you're fitting the model to your set of responses. Now, uh, there are already some non-parametric IRT models that can relax these functional form assumptions. Um, but some of the models, while relaxing functional form assumptions, will still retain a monotonicity assumption and others uh, can't simultaneously estimate the item response functions and the latent traits and can't really be extended to downstream tasks like adaptive testing. So we're going to solve these issues with the GPIRT model. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to explain GPIRT and show uh, what I was talking about in terms of extending it to downstream tasks like uh, active learning in a machine learning sense. And I'm going to demonstrate its advantages with an application to the U.S. House of Representatives and demonstrate the adaptive testing with the narcissistic personality inventory. So explaining how the uh, GP IRT works uh, will be useful to first put the traditional IRT setup in a little bit more um, general notation. So what we have set up for these item response functions in an IRT model is that we have some latent function f of the latent trait that is then pushed through a sigmoid function to get the probability of a positive response. So this sigmoid function could be like the normal CDF that I showed you previously. Another popular choice is the inverse logit function. And for this uh, latent function f, you assume some functional form like the linear functional form that I showed you before. Our innovation is then to, instead of assuming uh, the functional form for uh, the latent functions f, we place a prior over these latent functions, a Gaussian process prior. And so what does that mean? It means that we're putting a multivariate normal prior over the latent responses, where the covariance matrix for this uh, multivariate normal prior is a function of the latent traits themselves, so that um, the latent uh, responses are going to be correlated as a function of how far apart you are in the latent space. Um, I'm going to explain sort of how this covariance matrix works in just a moment, but first I want to pause for a moment to note that when you have 
uh, this traditional um, linear functional form assumption in Bayesian estimation, when you put normal priors on the item parameters, your model then mathematically is a special case of this uh, multivariate normal setup that we have uh, for GPIRT. So what does this covariance matrix that I'm talking about look like? So suppose these are the latent traits for the five respondents in our example. Then our covariance matrix would look like this, where your responses are going to be correlated as a function of how close you are in the latent space. So for example, for these two respondents who are about one unit away in the latent space, their responses will be moderately correlated. Whereas for respondents who are closer together in the latent space, say about half a unit away, their responses will be more highly correlated. And for respondents who are further away in the latent space, their responses will be less correlated. And so we're going to take this as um, our prior covariance for these latent uh, responses and update our posterior given the observations. So that looks like this. We have some latent function. Here it's a quadratic shape that we don't know and we need to learn it. And so we're going to start off with a prior, which is, you know, as you see, very agnostic. And then we end up with our observations and we're able to use Bayesian updating to learn the shape of this functional form. Using this process, we could learn a, a number of uh, almost arbitrary uh, item response function shapes, uh, such as the ones depicted here. So essentially what we're doing is we're incorporating our uncertainty about the item response functions, functional forms themselves, rather than just our uncertainty about the respondents latent traits and the parameters of the item response functions. The major advantage of this approach is that we're able to accommodate essentially arbitrarily shaped response functions rather than imposing uh, some set of assumptions about the functional form that may be unwarranted. So what are the assumptions that we do make? Well, we're assuming that these latent functions are smooth. And most importantly, what we're assuming here is that respondents who are closer together in the latent space will just simply be more likely to respond similarly. And uh, using the, uh, this simple set of moderate assumptions, we're actually able to learn both the item response functions and the latent traits uh, just using those two assumptions. So how do we perform inference for the model? Uh, well, as I said before, we put these Gaussian process priors on the item response functions, and then we place a standard normal prior on the latent traits as in most other IRT models. Uh, but then, unfortunately, the posterior is analytically intractable. So we perform inference via MCMC -MC sampling, um, and we set up a, a Gibbs sampler algorithm presented in our paper. And I have that um, in, a, in a backup slide in case anyone's really particularly interested in that Q&A. So the other major uh, advantage of this um, Bayesian setup that I mentioned before is that we can straightforwardly extend it to downstream tasks like adaptive testing. And so what is that task? That's saying that suppose we've trained the GPIRT on some set of responses to estimate the IRFs for all your items in your battery. And now your task is that you wanna estimate the latent trait of some new respondent. So you can think about the educational testing uh, context, for example where they have information about their items and they want to learn the ability of a new test taker. So with this uh, active learning approach, we're just going to present a series of items chosen one at a time to the respondent, uh, chosen in an adaptive way to learn their latent score as quickly as possible. Um, the way we can do that in this setup uh, that isn't really as easily extended from, from other non-parametric models is we initialize our, initialize our belief to the prior, which is a standard normal, as I mentioned. Um, and then until some stopping condition is met, it could be a number of items. You know, we're presenting some smaller adaptive battery subset of our full battery. It could be a convergence criterion. Until our stopping condition is met, we're going to look at each item that the respondent hasn't yet answered, which will initially be all of them, of course, uh, but that pool will shrink as the respondent answers questions. We're gonna take each item they haven't answered and we're gonna compute the mutual information 
or the expected KL divergence uh, to the res uh, given the responses that we've received so far, which will initially be an empty set, but will grow as we go. So then we're going to take the item that has the highest mutual information, we'll present it to the respondent and obtain a response, and then we update our belief about their latent trait by simply multiplying the current belief by the chosen item's IRF for a positive response or its complement for a negative one. So it's a, a pretty straightforward way to extend given the way that we can estimate the IRFs for these items. So we can demonstrate uh, these advantages that I've talked about with the GPIRT by looking at some applications. The first application I'll go over uh, is a familiar one to political science. Um, it's going to be uh, the US Congress. Um, so we fit our GPIRT model using all of the non-unanimous roll call votes in the first session of the current House of Representatives. So most scaling procedures that are usually applied to the US Congress have this monotonicity assumption that we've talked about before. Um, but using our more flexible Bayesian non-parametric approach is going to allow us to better account for potentially interesting voting patterns and more accurately scale uh, extreme members of Congress, which I'll show you uh, in a moment. So what are the types of uh, item response functions that we're able to learn from the Congress data? Uh, well, first, I want to uh, show that, you know, many of the roll call votes in Congress do meet this monotonicity uh, assumption. For example, this is an election security bill that was a uh, Democrat-backed bill that resulted in a clean party line vote. And what you can see here is that even though we're abandoning the monotonicity assumption, so we're not opposing monotonicity, when a monotonic voting pattern is present, the GPIRT can recover that just as um, the traditional two-parameter um, IRT model would. Uh, we just don't impose it from uh, the, from the get-go. You know, on the other hand, we're able to uncover more uh, interesting item response functions as well, uh, such as this amendment to in the arms embargo to Cyprus. So here uh, you can see that we have an IRT model that's done just what we promised at the beginning. We said that we were going to give you an IRT model um, that can estimate IRFs that are potentially non-monotonic, potentially non-saturating, potentially asymmetric. And we can see this here, it's non-monotonic, right? It goes up and down and then up and down again. It's asymmetric and it's non-saturating. You can see that the probability of a positive response uh, never goes towards zero here. Perhaps most importantly in this uh, substantive context, <clears throat> we can uncover uh, U-shaped voting patterns where you have um, respondents at the extremes of the latent continuum, uh, responding to an item in the same way, but for opposite reasons. So in this example here, it was a bill to provide government funding to avoid a shutdown. And you had Republicans who were voting against the bill because it didn't have border wall funding. And you had progressive Democrats who were voting against the bill because it didn't clamp down enough on the Trump administration's immigration enforcement policies. So this is, um, an increasingly important uh, dynamic that we can see in legislatures where you have uh, ideological extremists on opposing ends of the continuum voting together to defeat a moderate proposal. And why is this important? It's important because a model that imposes monotonicity will treat such an item as essentially uninformative, as you can see in the uh, left panel there. And then importantly for um, extreme respondents who vote against the majority of their party, it's gonna force your estimate of their latent trait to moderate. Um, you can see that I've uh, noted a few of these rug marts in red. That's uh, the rug marts for the legislators popularly known as the squad, representatives Omar, Tlaib, Presley, and Ocasio-Cortez, uh, who is a member of the Democratic Socialists of America. And you can see that the traditional IRT model has uh, pushed their latent trade estimates towards the center when they should be on the end. Um, we can see this in DW nominate as well, uh, which is another monotonic method. And it, 
it's sort of the gold standard for congressional ideology scores, but it has placed uh, these extreme members as more conservative than most Democrats, whereas GPIRT is able to correctly place them on the far left of the US Congress. Uh, we can also see uh, a demonstration of our adaptive testing scheme um, that we did by using responses to a 40 item narcissistic personality inventory. Uh, so this inventory will ask questions like, which statement fits you best? Modesty doesn't become me, or I am essentially modest person. So you can see that one of those responses is clearly a positive response or a narcissistic response, and the other is a negative or non-narcissistic response, which gives us that data structure that I showed you um, at the beginning. So we collected responses to this NPI from the Open Source Psychometrics Project and a convenient sample from, uh, from the Qualtrics panel. So uh, we set up our uh, adaptive testing scheme like this. We fit our uh, GPIRT model on a randomly selected subsample of 2,000 respondents to learn the IRFs of the MPI battery items. We're then going to take 1,000 additional randomly selected respondents and try to estimate their latent traits uh, with the smallest subsample with our adaptive testing scheme. So to benchmark uh, how our adaptive testing scheme is doing, we're going to estimate their latent traits using their responses to the full battery, right? So we have their actual responses to the full battery. And so we're gonna use our estimated GPIRFs and their full response to the battery to estimate their latent trait and use that as our benchmark measure. How close can we get to what we would have gotten if we were able to ask them the full battery? We're gonna compare our adaptive testing results to a 16 item reduced form battery that was built by ex experts. Um, so folks on the psychometric side have uh, taken this 40 item battery and chosen the 16 items uh, that, you, that could best estimate someone's uh, narcissism trait if you had to give them a subsample of those items or a short form battery. We're also going to compare to a randomly selected battery uh, of the same length. So 16 randomly chosen items, 16 expertly chosen items, and 16 items chosen adaptively using our active learning scheme. And you can see that uh, with our adaptive testing procedure, we're able to get significant improvements over random, and we're even going to be able to do much better than the expertly chosen uh, fixed short form battery. So in conclusion, uh, our GPIRT model provides a flexible Bayesian non-parametric IRT model that's going to solve issues of parametric IRT models, which makes strong functional form assumptions that might be unwarranted and might mask interesting voting patterns and might poorly scale some respondents and issues of previous non-parametric IRT models that might retain monotonicity assumptions or might be unable to simultaneously estimate item response functions and responses, respondents latent traits and uh, that also aren't very well suited to downstream tasks. We're able to solve all these issues by using GP priors for the items latent response functions. And if uh, you want to take a look at our software for implementing the GPIRT model, uh, it's available at this GitHub repository that I have um, on the slides. And our full paper is also available on the research page of my website. Um, and, and the link is also there up on the slides. So thank you. All right, uh, thanks JB for that presentation. Our second presentation will be from Shushe Ishima of Harvard University presenting a talk entitled Keyword Assisted Topic Models. Uh, this is uh, also co-authored work uh, with Kosuke Imai and uh, Tomoya Sasaki, who I think is actually in the background there. Uh, Shushe, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thank you again for coming today. Uh, this is a uh, so in this talk uh, we're going to explain how we can use our substantive knowledge 
in a topic modeling context. And this is a joint work with Kosuke Imai and uh, Tomoya Sasaki. So uh, let's start. So texts are everywhere in political science. You can think of newspaper articles, legislative records, bills, treaties, uh, all of them can be a research interest of political scientists. And for a long time, we have conducted content analysis to understand what's written in these texts. And to do content analysis, we need to prepare a code book with carefully chosen keywords and definitions using our substantive knowledge. And with the code book, we have to read each document one by one uh, carefully. So it takes a lot of time. And of course you can hire undergrad RAs, but then you need to care about intercoder reliability. So this method is not very scalable. So over the past decade, political scientists have started to use automated content analysis. Probably you may have heard of latent judicial allocation, LDA, or structural topic models, STM. These methods are unsupervised machine learning methods, so you can enjoy fully automated analysis. And this method is uh, scalable. However, if you use one of those topic modeling approaches in your research, uh, you may face some practical challenges. The first challenge is that you actually need to label estimated topics. Because the uh, existing methods in political science are unsupervised machine learning methods, the model itself will only give you a list of words that are associated with the estimated topics. So it is actually researchers that uh, carefully read and interpret those words and uh, label the topic after they fit the model. And secondly, it is well known that the results of topic models are sensitive to the number of topics you choose before you fit the model. So the typical research procedure with the existing methods might be you collect the data, uh, fit the model, check the results, and if you are not satisfied with the results, you will change the parameters. So typically you will change the number of topics and fit the model again and check the results. So actually there is an iterative process going on behind the research. So to change this convention, we propose keyword assisted topic models, TATM. The basic idea behind the TATM is actually uh, quite simple. We label topics with keywords before we fit the model. In this way, we can use our substantive knowledge as keywords and incorporate them uh, in the model. And also by this way, since topics are pre-labeled, we can avoid post hoc topic interpretation and manipulation. The idea of using keywords itself is not uh, quite new. So we can find the original idea in uh, Jacarandi's paper in uh, 2012 but we're gonna extend uh, their model to uh, incorporate covariates and time dynamic components. And there are three advantages of TATM. First, if you use TATM, the estimated topics are more interpretable than the existing methods. So this will be our qualitative measure. And secondly, if you use TATM for document classification tasks, the results will be much closer to, uh, to the classification done by a human coders. So this is gonna be our quantitative measure. And lastly, the results of TATM will be much more robust to the number of topics you choose. And in our paper, we have three empirical applications to uh, demonstrate these advantages. But in this presentation, uh, we're gonna focus on one of the applications. So uh, let me move on to the uh, model. So here's the setup. We have D documents, K topics, B terms, and LK keywords for a uh, topic K. So you can assign different number of keywords to uh, each topic. So that's why uh, L is subscripted by K. And we have a quantity of interest. So that is uh, topic word distribution. So this characterizes the probability of topic in each 
sorry, probability of term B in each topic K. So by looking at this probability, you can know uh, what the topics are about. So let me give you a concrete example. So here we have K topics on roles. And the first topic is macroeconomics topic. And the last topic is a defense topic. And we have uh, the terms, so budget growth, et cetera, and security and force. So this is a K by V matrix. And as you can imagine, in macroeconomics topics, uh, economy related terms such as budget and growth should have higher probability than security and force. And in defense topic, uh, the budget and growth should have lower probability than uh, security and force because it is a defense topic. So the goal of the topic models is to estimate the values in this table using the data you have so that we can characterize the uh, estimated topics. So the question here is that how we can use keywords to guide the uh, topic word distributions, the quantity of interest. And we have a quite simple solution. We're gonna consider a mixture of two probability vectors. One is for keywords, uh, pi tilde, and the other for all terms, pi k. So let me go back to the example again, and let's focus on the defense topic. So defense topic is a keyword topic. So we uh, need to suppose two probability vectors, pi tilde defense and pi defense. And let's uh, think three keywords, alliance, military, and veteran. And there are a bunch of other terms in the corpus. So again, the columns are B. And in pi tilde defense, since this is a probability vector only for keywords, uh, we're going to assign some positive probabilities on uh, three keywords, but zero on all other terms in phi tilde. But in phi, since this is a probability vector for all terms, uh, the B, all B terms will have some positive probabilities. So that we can now consider a mixture of these two probability vectors. And the point I want to emphasize here is that the topics are not forced to contain keywords. So this is the beauty of the probabilistic model. So if you have enough amount of data, uh, even if you assign uh, bad keywords, uh, the data can override those keywords. And also, you don't have to provide keywords for all topics. So, uh, you, can, so you can think of it as uh, you can focus on the topics you are interested in. So the, a set of keywords you will provide will not cover the uh, all potential topics in the corpus. So this is the setup of our model. So now uh, let me uh, move on to the data generating process. So let's think about the data generating process for I word in uh, this document. So first, we need to draw a topic from a categorical distribution. Theta D here is called uh, document topic distribution. And this characterizes the proportion of topics in each document D. And ZDI is a, a topic indicator. And let's suppose ZDI is a keyword topic. So then we need to decide which probability vector to use. And since we have two probability vectors, uh, we are gonna use a Bernoulli distribution and draw an indicator variable, SDR. So now we have, now we know the topics to use and which probability vector to use. So finally, we can draw a word for ith position in this document, WDR, using the categorical distribution. And we have uh, priors to complete the model as well. So if you are familiar with the LDA, this is a straightforward extension of what LDA does. So if we don't have phi, uh, phi tilde, which is a case for no keyword topic, this is exactly the same as the LDA. So the only difference is that we consider a mixture of two probability vectors uh, in a keyword topic. So this is our base model. And then Tomoya will explain the application we have. Yes, thanks, Josai. So I'm going to explain the application of TATM. 
So the goal of this application is to compare the performance between THM and LDA. So we do this by looking at topic interpretability and the document classification performance, which uses human coding as a benchmark. So the data we use is Congressional Bills project data, and which covers more than 4,000 bills from 14 different sessions. And what's nice about this data is that human coders select the primary topic for each bill. And so we treat these human coded document level topic label as the truth. And these 21 topics are comes from a code book of competitive agenda projects. So human coders follow this code book. So another nice thing about this data set is that we can use this code book to extract keywords. So we mechanically extract keywords from topic descriptions in the CAP code book. So we're basically uh, using the same exact code book that CBP human coders use to assign topic to each bill. So we end, again, we end up having 21 keyword topics and we do not assign any no keyword topics because each bill is supposed to belong, it's supposed to be belong to one of our 21 topics. So the table I'm showing here uh, describes the label provided by CAP, number of bills assigned to each label and keyword, chosen keywords that frequently appear in the corpus. As you can see, there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of number of bills. So there is more than 800 bills for government operations topic, but there are only two bills assigned to culture topic. So now I'm gonna explain how to compare THM and LDA. So again, there are two evaluation criteria. One is topic interpretability, which we look at the, look at the top words, and there's a, we're gonna compare the document classification performance. So how we compare document classification performance. So first we treat labels provided by CAP and CBP human coders as the truth. And we compute areas under the ROC curves for TATM and LDA. So the challenge here is that researchers need to label estimated topics in LDA. So again, TATM comes with labels, but in LDA, you need to look into each topic and choose what kind of label you want to assign to each estimated topics. So our goal here is to match LDA estimated topics with CAP labels. And we do this by choosing topic labels for each estimated LDA topic, such that the AROC curve is maximized. The procedure will be first, consider all possible combination of pairs of estimated LDA topics and CAP labels and compute AUROC curve for everything. And then we consider AUROC curve as a cost, which means that if we perform better, the cost is lower. And we pick up ones that minimizes the total cost using Hungarian algorithm, which means that we pick up the, the pair which maximize the AUROC curve between estimated LDA and the true topic label provided by CAP. So by procedure, this uh, LDS classification performance cannot be better. So, which means that we choose the most favorable procedure to match LDA estimated topics and true label for LDA. So we cannot, LDA cannot do better. That's what I want to emphasize here. So we first show top words for selected topics. So first example we show is an example where TATM uncovers topics that LDA cannot. So on this table, we're showing estimated LDA topic that matched with labor topic label by uh, in CAP. As you can see, like this top, the top words for this topic do not contain any labor related terms. And if you look at other 20 topics, we cannot find any labor, uh, those top words do not contain any labor related terms as well. So now we're gonna look at the results for TATN. So this bolded terms are keywords assigned to labor topic and asterisks indicate keywords from different topics. So as you can see, like the TATM collects three keywords from labor topic, which are employee benefit compensation. And also it, can, it collects some like non keywords, but related to labor topics such as payment here. And we think like this is a, a one example that TATM uncovers topics that LDA cannot. 
And then, so next we're gonna show a results where T ATM prevents topic splitting. So here we're showing estimated LDA topics that match with transportation topic and foreign trade topic in uh, CAP, uh, code CAP. So again, like, so what we see here is that we see both transportation and top words for both topics. And if your researcher wants to decide which one to label transporta as transportation topic, it is very hard to decide, it, it's very hard task to do that. And now if you look at TATM, again, like transportation topic contains many transportation related terms and foreign trade topic contains a lot of foreign trade, foreign trade related terms, which means that TATM is now prevents topic splitting and also actually uncover foreign trade topics that LDA cannot. So next in next example, we show a situation where TATM can distinguish two similar topics and while well, LDA cannot. So now in this example, we're showing estimated LDA topics that match with immigration and law and crime label in CAP. So in, this, in these topics, immigration topic contains terms related to immigration as well as law and crime. And the law and crime topic in LDA contains kind of a like domestic security topic related terms. So now if you look at the results for TATM, surprisingly, it, dis it can distinguish these two similar topics. So first, if you look at immigration topic, it contains a lot of immigration related terms such as alien, immigration, homeland, border, status, nationality. And if you look at the law and crime topic for TATM, it has crime, court, enforcement, criminal, and code. So those terms, such as co criminal court or immigration, both appears in immigration topic for LDA. And but like TATM can distinguish these two while LDA mixes up these two topics. And lastly, we are showing a, a situation where both models fail to identify meaningful words. And I'm gonna explain why it happens in the later slide. So now this, this is showing the quantitative comparison where we show the ROC curves for six selective topics we have been shown. Sorry, so the X axis is a false positive rate and Y axis is a true positive rate. So the blue line indicates as a line for TATM, ROC curves for TATM and gray line for LDA. So we have five lines for each model because we run five chains with different initialization value. So uh, the interpretation of this figure is that if the size under these lines are bigger, the classification performance is better. So as you can see, like the size of the line, the size of the area under the blue line is bigger than the size uh, under the gray line, which means that TATM is and showing a better classification performance. And again, the government operations topic is kind of ambiguous and I'm gonna show it in the next slide. So why T18 fails in some situation? So we look into uh, documents assigned to government operations topic in CAP and uh, documents assigned to other five selected topics in CAP. So what we found is that in documents, classified as government operations topic in CAP, keywords appear less frequently. So this figure is shown in the density plot of the proportion of keywords in each bill. So again, blue line is for government operations topic and gray line for other five selected topics. So this figure is showing that on average, uh, proportion of keywords in each bill is lower for government operations topic compared to other five selected topics that we've been showing. We also found that documents classified as a government operations topic contain fewer unique keywords. So again, blue, line, blue bars for government operations topic and gray, gray bars for other five selected topics. So this plot is showing the number of unique keywords per each bill, which means that there's, in most cases, bills assigned to government operations topic contain like one or two or maybe zero unique keywords. 
But on the other hand, if you look at other five selected documents classified as other five selected topics in CAP, like they contain in sometimes like 15 unique keywords. So the keywords are connected to each other in other five selected topics. But if you look at the keywords in a government operations topic, they're pretty much scattered and the topic itself is very vague. So in conclusion, so we have start, started by talking about traditional content analysis where researchers use keywords derived from their substantive knowledge and they read a lot or they might hire RAs. The challenge here is that you may not have all the right keywords. And uh, uh, we, as we have talked about, there's a scalability issue or there's a, no principal way to validate their results. So people start using automated content analysis such as LDA or STM, but they still have challenges. For example, there are post hoc topic interpretation adjustments they need to do and they might face a sensitivity to the choice of the number of topics in some cases. But, so we propose tiered assisted topic model, TAPM, where human provide keywords to, to uh, improve the interpretation on the, the performance of the document classification. So what TAPM can do is to avoid post hoc topic interpretation adjustment. It improves topic interpretability. It increases the accuracy of classification performance and it is both, it is a robust to the results of the, to the number of different, to the choice of number of different topics. And we're showing uh, this last point in the different applications. And we have that in the paper. So if you're interested in, please look at it. So we have a full paper in archive and we have a, a package uploaded in a CRAN. And we also have a website to uh, describe how to use this package. So please visit. And we'll look forward to your comments or suggestions for uh, any of these uh, things, you know, both zero. So thank you so much. And uh, that's it from us. Thanks, uh, Shushe and Tomoya for that presentation. Uh, at this point, our presenters are available to take questions from the audience. <clears throat> you can ask a question using the Zoom Q&A button that, appear, that appears at the bottom of the webinar window. Uh, we've had a couple of questions come in already. Uh, so first, uh, from an anonymous attendee, uh, how do you determine, and this is for uh, Shushe and Tamoya, uh, how do you determine the optimal hyperparameters of LDA when you're doing the comparison or evaluation? So in our comparison, we are using the exactly same model except the uh, existing keyword. So I guess when you say hyperparameters, uh, probably you are mentioning uh, the hyperparameters. Sorry, uh, hyperparameters for the uh, document topic distribution or topic world distribution. But I think in our comparison, both are the so we 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 estimate those parameters for both LDA and TAT. Uh, Guy Moore asks, and this is also for um, for Shushe and Tamoya. Uh, could you expand on how the key ATM compares to previous works using seed words in topic models, such as seeded LDA, um, and then he lists a couple of authors, Yagar, um, Yagarla Moody and Watanabe, uh, and Guided LDA by Singh and Corex by Gallagher? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I think we can focus on the seeded LDA. Um, so the, um, I read the uh, Watanabe's paper. And then, the, although they call it seeded LDA, uh, the approach is slightly different from Jagarandi's paper. So the key ATM, our base model, is, as we mentioned, uh, exactly the same as the uh, Jagarandi's paper. So, but we have uh, two extensions that, have, that can take covariates and time, time dynamic component as a, a hidden Markov model. And for Watanabe's paper, um, they use, so, keywords to, uh, to update, so to uh, slightly tweak the uh, prior. So in that sense, in there, in Watanabe's model, uh, priors are kind of fixed, but in our method, you can also um, adaptively, adaptively estimate the prior based on the data you have. Um, I have a question for uh, JB. So um, in your talk, so when I think of IRT estimates, 
Um, what I think of is I have a, a, essentially a theoretical model of response. I'm assuming that model is true, or at least true enough. And then I'm using that structure to extract information from data based on behavioral patterns. And uh, that IRT framework is actually kind of, uh, now, now I think of it, is a little bit weird relative to spatial voting because, as you mentioned, uh, as you get further from the status quo, you can actually get people on both sides of the of the estimate, so to speak, or of the uh, of the status quo, so to speak, voting against a, a change because they actually prefer the status quo. Given it depends on what the sort of alternative is. Mm -hmm. um, but the it seems to me that if you wanted to implement that as a as the as a different theoretical model, the answer wouldn't be to try to make the process you know partially or fully non-parametric. It would be to impose a different structure and then extract. Um, a more efficient answer uh, from that structure, assuming the structure is true. So the, the questions are first, is there an underlying theoretical model that's guiding the implementation that you guys are, are creating? And then um, second, if, if there is or isn't, um, is it possible to get a more efficient um, estimate, uh, less variation essentially, um, if you make parametric assumptions um, that are sort of rooted in in some sort of different theoretical model? Uh, yeah, so that's a great set of questions. Um, I'm actually going to take the second one first. And so um, my, my answer to your question of if you can get sort of uh, more efficient estimates by assuming more structure to uh, the functional form of the item response functions, the answer is uh, perhaps, right? And that is, if the real data generating process uh, matches closely your assumptions about it, yeah, I think that you are likely to get um, you know, so, some more efficient estimates there. Um, what we have found out um, in practice with dealing with this uh, uh, paper is that um, you actually, even if you think that a lot of your items are gonna follow your assumptions, <clears throat> even some relatively small deviations by some of your items can actually make GPIRT more efficient. Um, so with our uh, narcissistic personality inventory uh, application, um, this is something that people use traditional two parameter models for uh, uh, all the time. Um, but we found with some out of sample fit tests that uh, GPIRT actually performed much better than the uh, model with more assumptions that you would might think that you get um, more efficient estimates out of, and 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 probably you know might be more worried about uh, overfitting or something like that. So, um, so the answer is maybe, um, and it depends on just how good your assumptions are. Uh, even small deviations might actually make GPRT more efficient. Hmm. Um, and yeah, so so then your question about um, is there a the theoretical model that's underlying this? And I think that there's a couple of ways that we can think about that and, and address that issue. Um, so first, we can think about uh, sort of a specific um, social choice or game theoretic type model that might match uh, this empirical model very closely. Um, I mean, not going to go into details of it right now. We've talked about it with a few of our colleagues and could have to do with things like, uh, you know, information cascades or something like that. Um, but uh, more specifically, I think that the, the best answer to your question is that uh, this is could be a structural estimator for a wide class of theoretical models um, for, for this behavior, right? So um, you could have for instance, the data generating process that they start with in um, Clinton Jackman Rivers 2004 to arrive at the two parameter IRT model, or you could have a data generating process for something like an unfolding model. Um, and you can show that the GPIRT is actually a good structural estimation model for either of those theoretical models. So uh, I think that that is, is maybe a, a better way to think about its relation to the theoretical models. Uh, there's a, a question here from uh, uh, Davey Morera, and it's, it's, uh, this is for Shushe et al. 
Um, and it m models the question I have as well. Um, so the question from Davey is, uh, Shushi and co-authors, thanks for the amazing presentation. How does key ATM deal with the emergence of new topics over time? And what I was thinking was uh, related, uh, LDA is, is trying to discover topics, right? It's trying to tell you what the best topics are that, that fit the data. And it seems like your uh, model is, is quite, or your procedure is quite different because um, you are trying to, at some level, force the emergence of certain topics or define the emergence of certain topics. So um, how, does it, how does your method deal with the emergence of new topics over time? And how does your method um, sort of ensure optimal, uh, uh, what do you call it? Oh, I guess optimal choice or optimal calculation of topics. Right. So for the uh, emergence of topic part, so unfortunately the key ATM does not model the emergence of topic itself. But what you can do is that you can uh, assign a keyword that uh, appear only, let's say, after 1950s or like 1980s, the period you suppose those topics might emerge. So that's a one way of doing. And uh, secondly, for your question, uh, Justin's question, uh, yeah, so, in the, so the key ATM uses the uh, information of keywords through the prior. So in that in, in, in that sense, it's like mildly forcing to have a certain topic. Can I add to that point? So like, I guess like, so the kind of uh, building up this model is that researchers have some knowledge about the documents they're studying. So if you wanna uh, look at the emergence of topics over time, you have some idea what kind of topics would emerge or what kind of topics would disappear over time. So like you can like assign keywords, as you said mentioned, that appear in a later period or in the earlier period. So that like we kind of assume that researchers know something about emergence of topics or what kind of keywords they want to use. And that so we're not we're modeled is not about like discovering, but like mm -hmm. it's more like a, like testing or like checking their understanding. Well, it's 1 p.m. on the East Coast, at least. Uh, so I'd like to thank J. Brandon Duck Mayer and Shushe Shima and also Tomoya Sasaki for being our presenters this week. Uh, their presentations will be posted to our website shortly after this broadcast if you'd like to share them with a colleague or watch them again later. I'd also like to invite you to join us next week, uh, Friday, June 5th. We will host a talk entitled Joint Image Text Classification of Tweets Using BERT and CNN by Patrick, Ru, Patrick Wu and Malter Mebane of the University of Michigan, and another talk entitled Principled Estimation of Regression Discontinuity Designs with Covariates, a Machine Learning Approach by Jason Anastasopoulos of the University of Georgia. Please see our website, www.methods-colloquium.com, to get more information about these talks. Uh, everyone, thanks for being here today. Presenters, thanks for uh, a very interesting set of uh, talks, and uh, hope to see you next week. Thanks. Thank you so Thank much, much for inviting. Thank you. Thanks.